Today on the show, I'm happy to have Mohit Kalra. He's the co-founder of Tenderfix AI. They're automating tenders to bids within seconds. You moved to Germany from India, and then you had to raise money. What was the experience like of figuring that whole process out? Absolutely. It's moving to a new country is always challenging, right? So you're not familiar with the culture. You're not familiar with the language. And it's a new environment. It's something out of your comfort zone. And for me, I guess the biggest challenge was really figuring out the bureaucracy. Simply because being an international founder adds additional layer of complexity from your visa perspective. So let's say you have a certain procedure for founding a company. This procedure gets 10 times more complicated if you are an international person. So not from a EU country. And on top of it, if your residence permit is expiring. So I was in a situation where my residence permit was expiring in, I think, in a matter of 10 days. And I had to figure out everything because to register my company, I need to have a legal residence. And to have a legal residence, I need to be employed somehow. So I was stuck in a catch 22 situation and it was really tricky to navigate it. And in the end, we found out certain ways on, on how we can do this. And of course, there were, I got a lot of help from my colleagues, from my peers and from the investors we got in touch with, they helped me navigate through all of this. So you found a good group of people to help you figure this out. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's definitely the network and the people around you that can really help you navigate tricky situations, especially the ones which you have never seen before, right? I've never registered a company outside of India, let alone registering in Germany, which is anyways quite infamous for its bureaucracy and red tape. But I was fortunate enough to navigate it all. Is this the first uh, startup that you founded? Not really. So Tenderfix is not my first startup. I had my first company back in India. It was actually in the industrial engineering and mechanical industry. And this is now my family business. And I grew that company for roughly five years. And currently it has over 60 employees and it's doing quite okay, I would say. So it's still an operation. You just have somebody else running it? Absolutely. Now it's my family business. So my, my family has taken over it. And I'm more on the strategic decision maker side of things. So not really involved in the day-to-day -day operations or day-to-day -day functioning of the company. It's really just a strategic decision making that I take active part in. Apart from that, currently Tenderfix is really my main startup and main project where I'm focusing at and all my energy goes into it. And before Tenderfix, I also had a couple of failures in terms of utilizing AI for medical technology, utilizing AI for climate technology. But those were pretty early stages. We didn't really raise any money for these projects. It was all bootstrap. But for Tenderfix, once we had a certain level of conviction that, hey, we are on the right track, that's when we decided to raise money. What was that level that made you see this one's different than the others? I think... There was definitely a lot more positive feedback from the market. When we were talking to our customers, we realized quite quickly that, hey, there is definitely a big need for this product out there. And unlike my other products, which were bound to a lot of fundamental research, or the market was still very nascent or still very small, with Tenderfix, what we found was tenders have been in use for B2B procurement for more than 100 years, right? And essentially, they have not changed a lot. All they have changed is moved from paper bills to maybe PDFs or some other digital documents. But at the end of the day, it's still an entirely manual process, right? Someone on the other end is reading hundreds, 200, 500 pages documents and figuring out, okay, whether it's relevant for their company or not. And I think it was really the feedback that we got from our customers, the scale, impact on technology that ultimately built conviction within us founders that, hey, this is something big and we have to act on it now. And that's how we decided to raise money for it. So are you, now did you, with your first company that you had that's still operational, did you raise money mm -hmm. for that or was that, you did? No, that was no. purely bootstrap. So Okay. It really uh, took a long time for us to build that company. We didn't raise any external money at all. I think my biggest learning from building that company was how can you be frugal enough to, to really help sustain a company? Because 
We put in some of our initial investments, but that was all founder money going in. There was no institutional money or nothing from the VC side. Even till date, we have not traced and it's a gift to send bootstrap. So now that you are running it with some capital behind you, what, how's the experience been? Is it, do you find it better, different? I, I feel that every industry and every startup has their, has its own unique journey, right? I feel in the mechanical and industrial engineering sector, it's quite capital intensive to set up a factory or to, to set up the plant machinery. You definitely need a lot more capital. So the iteration cycles for product, what kind of machines you build is slow. You cannot really build a new machine within three months and then roll it out. It takes years and years of research and continuously improving and listening to the market. So I feel that industry is really slow moving in my perspective and not really a perfect use case or a perfect scenario for a VC or an institution because there you, you are expected to grow at a certain pace, right? And I feel software and AI SaaS, especially nowadays, is really in that niche category, simply because you don't need a lot of money to really scale up your operations and the iteration cycles are much faster. So with this tech, who's the ideal user? Our ideal users are medium to large size companies who typically receive more than a thousand tenders a month. Most of our pilots received somewhere between 30,000 to 40,000 tenders in a year. And the scale of companies, you can imagine 200 to 300 employees and above. And some of our pilots even have 4,000 employees working within the company. So our target customer is really medium to large size uh, companies receiving a lot of tenders in a given year. And so when they engage with the platform, how mm -hmm. is it helping them manage all of this? Right. So. How we imagine the initial product was that uh, we will automate everything from day one. But as you can think about that, uh, bringing in this magnitude of changes is never easy. And that's why we decided to do it in phases. The first phase that we're working on really is the information extraction and relevant information filtering. So how it helps our user is instead of somebody spending three, four, five hours really going hundreds and thousands of pages reading the tender, our software analyzes these documents. And since our software connects with the database of our clients, we know what kind of products or services do they sell. Simple example, if there is an electrical company providing, let's say, cables, panels, you name it, if a tender comes in, and this is a huge tender for a governmental building or for whatever building project, right? You know that only one section within this tender is going to be focused on electricals. The rest will be civil, plumbing, furnishing, interior, so on and so forth. So how it helps in the current stages, this tender is ingested by our AI, it, which goes through the entire document and filters out, okay, Page number 20 to 25 are only relevant for you and the rest you can basically ignore. So instead of somebody manually going through hundreds of pages, our software can really do this within seconds and direct the attention of the end customer to really focus on a specific number of pages. So you can imagine if somebody has to read 100 pages versus if somebody has to read only 10 pages, that's a direct 10x improvement in the response time and spending efficiency. So that's stage one, really finding out where the relevant information is. Stage two that we are working on right now is the recommendation engine. So once we have identified what relevant pages are for our customer, next step we move forward is understanding those technical requirements and matching them with the product catalog of our customer. So if the requirement says, hey, I need a cable for 20 amps, which is 50 meters in length and so on and so forth, uh, our AI connects to the catalog database and can recommend you which product to offer in response to this particular requirement. After this, the next step would be that we really integrate end-to-end -end and the offers are also generated automatically. But that's coming in the coming months. So is this for private corporation like procurement options as well as for like government agencies who have these types of? So yeah. at the moment, our focus is really on the supplier side of things, not really on the government side of things, simply because 
getting into this industry from private side is a bit easier as compared to getting into government clients. And how we see it is currently our technology is more friendly for the suppliers who want to bid for the tenders, right? Once we crack this, then the long-term vision is that we also get onto the procurement side where you're getting multiple bids from different vendors and how do these bids compare to your given requirement. So once we crack the supplier side, then that's when we move on to the procurement side. Makes a lot of sense. So if any of our listeners wanted to learn more about your product, become a user, how could they do that? Absolutely. So you guys can reach us at tenderfix.ai or just write us an email, info at tenderfix.ai or follow us on LinkedIn. Thank you, Mohit, for coming on the show and everybody for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star review. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.